Hi everyone, today's Real Vision Daily Briefing is sponsored by CraneShares. Learn about their KCCA ETF at craneshares.com forward slash KCCA forward slash Real Vision. Now to the top analysis of today's markets. Is it time to get ahead of the downturn? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. With me today is Ben Miller, co-founder and CEO of Fundrise. Hi, Ben. It's great to have you back on. Yeah, thanks for having me. So it's been quite a week, uh, quite a week for you, because you just told us you're off a red eye. So thank you for persevering and joining us. Um, but another big move in bonds, the 10-year sitting really close to that 5% uh, mark. A uh, little, little less maybe than today. It should kind of stand still today, but we're right up against that level. Selling pressure, pressure hitting equities once again. We're down across the board. Um, losses of over one percent um, for the Nasdaq uh, and S and P. Um, and I think at some point during the day, by the way, the ten year did top five percent, but it it pulled back, so it was brief. But um, and when we've seen the dollar continue to. Uh, move higher and then now we're everyone worried about intervention so we've got a lot going on how are you uh, feeling about the market environment right now it feels like it's pretty much on track to the, the natural ways these things play out right the fed raised rates there's this lag the lag is normally six to 12 months and during the lag it, it's such a long and variable lag as milton friedman says that that people start to think oh there won't be a collapse. And the markets really finally rolled over in the last 30 days from being Fed driven to being sort of that now in the hands of the bondholders. The, mm -hmm. the bond market controls the market now where it didn't before and everything was Fed driven. And the bond market is clearly in free fall. I mean, it's, it's really driving everything else in the economy. The bond market's the most important thing happening in the US economy today. Yeah, absolutely. And the action, and, and it's worth reminding, we all, a lot of us know and have been living it, but the bond market has just been whipping around so volatile. And we see these quick moves as everyone keeps changing their mind about the economy and recession, and now having to deal with all this issuance and figuring out what's driving. Is it because, is it now a supply issue or <coughs> fundamentals or both of them, right? So there's a lot going on. We had a lot of the guests on both on our, on the daily briefing this week, but also across our platform, really expressing concern about like a large risk event. Let's have a listen to some of the highlights and then we'll talk on the other side. We had rates mm -hmm. pinned in negative territory mm -hmm. overseas, pinned at zero here for a long time. What is that? That's holding a beach ball underwater, mm -hmm. right? It's very unnatural. And when the beach ball finally lets up, you don't want to be the one to limit how high the beach ball is going to go if you're a trend follower, right? Here's the big issue. I think this is the first time in U.S. bond market history that we've seen three consecutive down years uh, in the bond market. How many people yeah. are sitting on those capital losses and don't want to do anything different because of it? Yeah. That stasis, in my opinion, is one of the things that's going to keep this train rolling until we get a cathartic you know, type of event. So even though output is growing, it's not growing in the same way nor the same sustainable fashion as it did before 2008. So while we have variable short run conditions here and there along the way, when you step back, you still see that silent depression in the background. People are holding equities because they think that if there's a correction, it will be for one, two months, and then it will go back up. And most likely, if it falls, you're going to buy more. That's very nice when we talk about it. But human psychology says that when the market falls 20%, you're selling, you're not buying. And that's the difference between retail and institutional money. And it's okay to be a spectator. I feel that we're in one of these time periods right now where I'm being very cautious. Um, it's a good time to reduce leverage and have wider stops to let your trades breathe.
So you can see the full interviews and episodes on our website for both the daily briefing, of course, which lives there, but all of the content we've been doing uh, at realvision.com. And if you are on YouTube and you are not an RV, full RV member, not just a subscriber on YouTube, but an RV member, head over to the website and you can find sign up trials. Uh, so Ben, um, it, 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 you, it's funny because they're both in stocks and bonds. People are looking for sort of this capitulation moment. And it seems like they think that risk is mispriced. How are, how are you thinking about this? Well, there's a lot of debate in the last 30 days about this term premium that basically yeah. what's happened, they call it volatility, but it's really prices have declined in treasuries by 20% since May, right? That's a huge decline. And the debate you're seeing is basically that there's all this new supply of treasuries and there's all this borrowing and that's basically causing uh, yields to go up. And I think that's part of the story, but, but to me, it's actually more fundamental. And the fundamental difference is that there's no demand. So I think it's, de it's a demand story and demand and money is called liquidity. Mm. And that's basically as the market rolls over from being a um, you know, Fed driven story to market driven story, liquidity in the market slowly but surely been drained away. It's like the Fed actually intended that. They have QT, they have trillion dollars of QT going out the door. They raise rates. Banks basically are, are basically out of liquidity in most cases. So, so as liquidity leaves the system, we're seeing yields rise. So I, I think that is what's happening and also what happened. So in 2007, August 2007, I was at a beach house with a bunch of friends and I walk into the room, they're talking about bonds. I remember saying, bonds, oh my God, you're right. The bond market's collapsing. This is, this is the beginning of the end. This is August of seven. And they look around at me and they say, no, we're talking about Barry Bonds. Because he had broken the, broken the world record for <laughs> home runs. <laughs> and I don't know anything about that. But like, so, so this is really reminiscent. <laughs> you're, I, 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 I just want to say, when you walked in, thank God they were talking about Barry Bonds. Otherwise, you're in the wrong beach house. <laughs> if you're in the beach <laughs> house and people are talking about treasury bonds, you got to get a funner beach house. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a that's definitely right because I, <laughs> but this this is so reminiscent of the of the the oh seven to you know late oh eight period where the credit market basically started to lose liquidity, started to freeze up, and it goes through a period of uncertainty. But the the, the, the trajectory is clear, right? There's going to be less liquidity over the next six to twelve months because rates are staying high and the QT uh, uh, you know roll off. Yeah. Roll off is still in play. Um, the cascading effects of that are happening everywhere, and there's and there's still more treasury issuances. So that's soaking up the uh, RRP, right? The reverse repo market. If you look at the RRP, right, it was at one one point nine trillion, and it's fallen to one point one trillion in you know relatively short time, and it's looking like it's basically like on a trajectory to get to zero by March. The, the second it gets below. You know, the closer it gets to zero, the more likely you'll see uh, a, a true liquidity crisis, and the Fed's going to have to intervene. So there's, it's 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 crystal clear to me that we're headed towards a another another crunch or crisis, and it's really only a question of like how you prepare for it, what you're going to do about it, because there's no there's really no stopping it at this point. Yikes. Okay, so what is that fallout? As somebody who's obviously trying to prepare for it. What does that fallout look like? And and we're super interested to hear your point of view because we're, when you hear the narrative for some people, um, because everyone's looking for like the the break, right? Like what's going to break first? And when you listen to some people, they say, well, in 07, 08, the great financial crisis that you referenced, it was the investment banking area that, you know, that just imploded um, and that took everything down with it. This time around, it's going to be private, the private market. Because that's where all the activity's been. You know, investment banks that had their handcuffs put on them and the regulation. And so in the zero interest rate, low inflation environment, private credit went crazy. The private markets went crazy. So that's where the excesses are probably. Um, and that's going to go down. Or the pension system that ate up all these treasuries that are. Where, how do you, what, what, where are you most concerned about? Where do you think the, the sort of fragile point is? Yeah, I mean, it, it. I think that's difficult to predict because you didn't mention it, but AIG was yeah. a huge blow up, Fannie, Freddie. So it wasn't just the investment banks. I mean, the, the essence of it is where there was high leverage. 
and so you have to say, well, where is their high leverage again? And there's a lot of leverage. And actually, funny thing enough is like typically the treasuries are highly levered. And I, I, I believe one of the reasons you're seeing treasuries sell off is that there, that's actually there, there's forced selling going on. Like they have to sell because nobody would, would want to sell treasuries today and take that loss unless they have to. So um, where is there a lot of leverage? I mean, everywhere. Right. There was yeah. tons of leverage. Well, we had on. zero interest rates. Of zero course, there's rates. leverage everywhere. You had to. Otherwise, you were you had no returns. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, so the banks obviously have a huge mark to market losses that they haven't recognized. Uh, insurance companies, uh, pension, uh, sorry, pension funds, private equity funds. So it's I think it's sort of beside the point exactly where it blows up. Mm. The, the point is, is that it it. it, it whether it blows up or there's just a deep decline because of the lack of liquidity in the market, it's, there seems, I mean, on the ground, let's talk about what's happening on the ground. We, we are a buyer and seller. We, we own $7 billion of real estate. We're, we're frequently in market. And uh, we were in market buying something. And there were 30 bids for this property a month ago, 30 offers. Now there's only one left. In my career, it's very rare to see people withdraw offers, let alone dozens of people be like, I know I put an offer in, but I'm walking away from this offer. And people are, and that is a kind of a, a sign of fear and capitulation. And so the commercial real estate market is, you know, it prices off of treasuries. Mm. And so we used to price at a 4% cap rate. Now treasuries are at five, and and I mean long term treasury three year treasury it went to three one five today, so you know there's there's a huge amount of embedded losses in the system, and unfortunately that that means decline, you know one way or the other. So at the risk of oversimplifying this, how do you survive that kind of situation if you're operating a real estate fund? Yeah, I mean. It's sort of a tried and truism, right? Which is that you you have low leverage, you have liquidity, you have you know uh, you don't have office building, you have a rental apartment buildings. There's lots of like lower risk strategies, and then one of the reasons why I'm so convinced there'll be a downturn is that for 15 years, zero interest rate essentially re- rewarded risk taking and punished and punished um, risk management. I mean, essentially risk management, anybody who managed risk didn't get venture funding, didn't get promoted. And so risk was the only way to go get, get, you know, make your way. And so that's why there's so much risk that's sort of taken on and hidden in the system. And so now we're in this period where that risk now is, you know, we're going to pay for it. Mm. And so it's, but it, so I mean, there's this, being, too conservative, overly defensive, being liquid. So none of this is, I mean, this is all pretty boring stuff. You hold on. And then if you're lucky, you can basically buy the bottom. That's the, that's the main goal, but um, we're not at the bottom yet. That's for sure. Wow. That's such an important point that you just brought up that that is so true that you not only did you, I, I remember talking to all sorts of different people about this deal, people, people who are investors. I had talked to Howard Lindzen, who did a, a lot of VC investing, couldn't get, couldn't invest. Didn't, they didn't, because the model that he was looking for, he's like, I'm not going to invest in this sort of amount of money valuation risk-taking because it's not prudent, but yet you couldn't find a deal because that was just the environment it was. And that's just one example of many who have come on these programs and kind of described that. But now's the reckoning for that, right? Because there is leverage everywhere. This is a great question from Boris. Um, and I'm, and we'll come back to sort of your thoughts about commercial real estate in the, in the bottom. But I think this, you sent over some, some charts that I think are very, because now we very instructive. Because now we want to say, okay, what happened? So there's leverage everywhere. So it doesn't really matter where the blow up is. We just need to know it's happening. So then what happens after that? And this is Boris's question. Hello from Germany. Hi, Germany. Uh, my, My question is, discussions have considerable negative outlook, you know, the tone, the sentiment. However, as we discuss this, is it already, should it already be priced in to a great extent? Perhaps a good time then to buy stocks, question mark. This is the, I think that, 
Michael Nicoletis brought this up in the highlight we just did. Everybody's looking for the bottom, thinking the bottom's priced in. And to be honest, there are pe certainly people, Raul kind of has a, a view about that as well. Um, but he's longer term. But, you know, there is this feeling, okay, maybe all the bad news is priced in already. I, I, I don't think that based on the chart you sent over, that's your feeling, is it? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you want to bring this chart yeah. up. Maybe maybe we can bring the one Brian and then we'll walk through the other ones. But that one at the right at the end that shows the because the historic or do you want to do a historical one? Should we do the forecast for 24? Or do you want to pull a let's certain do, time? Let's do the table first because it's it's helpful okay. to get a historical context of you know, what normal is. Right. OK. Yeah. Let's try to pull that up. A recency bias. It's hard for people to remember something that goes back 10, 20, 50 years. But here's a chart of of uh, the last six recessions. And in every recession, it was preceded by rates rising significantly. I mean, in 2005, rates went from 1% to 5.5%. So, and, and that basically is very similar to what happened just, just now. And it took 17 months before the market collapsed in, in, in October 08. So there's a long lag every single time on average 10 months but you know last time in 08 it was a 17 month lag it was a long lag and during that lag um people debated whether or not we were at the bottom and in that lag and i think it's true in most lags the equity market is actually lags is the lagging indicator not a leading indicator and so he, in july 06 they they hit the top of rates market collapses in 08 we don't bottom well, eight months after the recession was called. So that's 20, 20 some months from when the rates peak. So I think we, we, we should expect the credit markets to be the, the best leading indicator and mm -hmm. the equity markets basically lag. And so you just saw treasuries fall 30, 40, 50% in the last year or two. And, and, the, and the stock market's only fallen 15%. So I, I don't think that's tenable over the long term. Typically, if rates have, have increased this much and, and treasuries and bond markets fall this much, the equity market can't be out of step for that long. It's unsustainable. And so then you have to have a view that if, if you think stocks are going to maintain, that you have to have a view that, that rates are going to fall. So this is super interesting. And by the way, um, I just mentioned Raul. That's that. I think that's that's his point of view. We're going to replay part of this when he and I do an AMA coming up, and we'll 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 dig into that because I think some of you are probably wondering about that. But Ben, part of this then, when you're figuring out the lag, is understanding when credit markets peak, right? Because I think one of the problems is they bounced up yields. We thought that was the peak, and so people are kind of calculating that lag, and then they went down and up again, and down and up again. So. Do you think we're at peak now? And I'm going to bring in a comment from Christopher, um, one of our very smart community members, saying that he got a flash today from a serious source hinting at 6.5% treasury yields. Does it feel like the market can, even if it's an overextension, can kind of freak out and go that high? Or do you feel like we're at peak now? Yeah, I agree with that. I agree that... Um... I mean, the, my one of my indicators is the RRP, right? Again, it's the how much in reserves do banks have sitting at the Fed, and they had two trillion, and now it's down to one one trillion, and so, and it's been in free fall. So if that falls, you know, to half a trillion or even less, I think you'll see start seeing the market really start to seize up, and then what you'll also see is more pressure on yields to go up. Because there's going to be liquidity shortfalls. So, like as liquidity disappears from the market, yields actually increase. So, until the market really starts to have it, I, I think that it's crisis. It really has room to continue to, to, to deteriorate, and and the Fed's telling you stay at the short end of the curve, stay at five and a, you know they you get five five and a half percent if you're a money market. So, stay at the short end of the curve. You know, I'm not saying you should try to call the bottom. I'm not trying to call the bottom. And so, and, and so it's more about defense than offense for the time mm -hmm. being. There's plenty of time to come off the sidelines once you sort of see the wreckage. But to think that this 15-year cycle of zero interest rates and $7 trillion of money printing is not going to have sort of the, the symmetrical down from it is, I think, is like a naive. 
So let's pull up your other chart. Thank you, Christopher, for flagging that because it was great to get Ben's thoughts on that. Let's pull up uh, this uh, this chart now because I think so that kind of move in treasuries and that kind of market event um, creates a lot of pain, as we know. And so you were talking about, and we've heard this, right? Stocks and bonds can't both be right. Like what's happening here? So this is pretty frightening. Um, but this is this is uh, your forecast for 2024 if we see this based on what's happened historically. And you sent some great charts because it looks similar, right? The dot-com bubble looks similar. Great financial crisis looks similar in all of these instances when you're putting that lag into place. But this is a lot of pain ahead, to Boris's point, a lot of pain ahead for stocks still. Yes, this is simply taking the historical averages and applying them to the present situation. And so you wouldn't see the market finally roll over or capitulate you know, break down until uh, you know, May 2024. On average, it be May could you know could be longer, could be shorter. But uh, there's we're still a, a ways before we sort of get to the average lag, and then from there, the equity market falls further because that's you, so you start seeing as earnings decline and you start seeing unemployment spike. That's another. I mean, unemployment typically is very very healthy. Like it's very low unemployment going into a recession. Everybody says, but unemployment's so low. So unemployment's a lagging indicator. And unemployment really bottoms even after the stock market. And so on average, the U.S. would lose 3 million jobs if we go into a recession. And so I think like, like what about the current situation we think is better than average? Where we have higher debt loads, um, more treasury, more, more demand on debt, uh, higher leverage in terms of the across the economy. And so the only the only two advantages we have, which I think are are what's slowing down the downturn, is that there's a lot of people who have locked in corp- corporations, home buyers, a lot of locked in, so that's delaying. And then also you have a lot of um, of stimulus, right? And that stimulus is basically providing a positive support to the economy. But those two things those two things are both you know, they they burn off over time. Yeah. And so times against those two things. And until we basically the Fed essentially starts taking them, so basically giving relief to the market, we're going to continue to see decline. I mean, until the Fed provides material relief to the market, we will continue to see declines. So that's almost definitive. And so in the meantime, that just means you have to be on defense. So what do you make of the idea that uh, if we were to see the bond market start to the, the the you could argue maybe the Fed's already lost control of the bond market, but if they really if we really start to see a rapid increase in Treasury yields, it's just it's it's not sustainable in order to pay just the interest on the debt. They're just going to roll over that whole connection to to the debt, and so in one way or the other, they're going to come in, and that's what's going to prevent this next thing from happening. Because after the great financial crisis, they figured out they have all these tools, and one way or the other, they're going to come in, whether it's yield curve control, whether it's it, they're not going to call a QE, but another type of QE. Um, just generally, they're that that's what's going to <clears throat> reprovide the liquidity before. So it's not that they're saving the stock market, but too many things are going to start to blow up. They can't pay the interest on the debt, so they're just going to have to come in, and they'll do it under whatever guise they they can. A new acronym. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that like um, just like BTFP, just bank term uh, funding program, where they came in and provided liquidity to banks during the Silicon Valley bank crisis, that the Fed is likely to do sort of uh, uh, activity to try to help the markets. But I think they're likely to pick winners and losers. They're not going to, it's not going to be a broad-based uh, uh, stimulus like we saw in 2020. Mm. And, you know, like, I mean, I think that I can, it's easy for me to imagine something that looks like yield curve control where they they roll their portfolio, their $7 trillion portfolio over towards the longer end of the curve to try to bring the curve down. Uh, they try to basically uh, bring the banks into the treasury market. So I definitely see them operating on the margins to, to try to um, uh, keep the treasury market healthy. But in all the circumstances we're describing, we're describing more problems, worse, more challenges. And so that's why you want to counsel patients and, and not try to get ahead of the Fed. You know, mm. the Fed is like, it's, it's, so, it's so fascinating. They really are the 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 um the indicator like the when the the when the fed basically starts dropping rates 
uh, that's usually telling you that there's a problem. And if you look at the past downturns, actually the, the Fed was dropping rates in 07, right? The Fed was dropping rates in 01. No, it was a 2000. Like the Fed was dropping rates before yeah, the- Beware the, the pivot because it means yeah, but, more trouble's coming before- yeah, the crash happened after the Fed dropped rates. Yeah, I know. We forget like the, the, it's been it's been sort of turned into something that means like going to open the spigots and it's going to send stocks up. But that's not always how it's played out. Like that got condensed somehow along the lines. Right. I mean, the, the two important historical lessons, right, is long and variable le- lags, long and variable lags. So just like it takes a while for the Fed to slow the market, it'll take a while for the Fed to speed up the market. And two, you know, the, the, the Fed's obsessed with not, having inflation come back again. So they're very, they're, I think they're going to be, they're going to pick winners and losers in the market, but I think that they're not going to want inflation to come back. So they're going to be parsimonious in their stimulus. And that's, and that's going to mean a lot of pain probably for normal people. So we don't want to be too negative all across the board because, you know, I'm thinking in this, they're, a lot of people are trying to figure out, well, where do I hide? But also, where, where is there any opportunity? And if you seem like a calm person who has an enormous amount invested in real estate, commercial real estate, it's because it's not the only thing you're doing, right? So what are you up to in terms of diversification? Where do you see opportunity? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we are investing in real estate, and real estate is a slow, long-term business, a long-term business, a long-term investor. We also are invested in tech, private tech. We, our whole business, business is to break down the barriers between the public and private markets. So we allow individuals to invest in the private real estate. We also allow individuals to invest in private tech. So we have a fund that anybody can invest into that invest into uh, private tech, tech companies. And what's happened is there's a revolution happening in the technology industry called AI. And there are companies that are growing like crazy that are changing the world. And most people cannot invest in them. The ones that are public are already priced to the moon, but the ones that are private that are actually largely the ones driving the innovation are not investable by the public. And that I think that's unfair, not equitable. So we, we changed that by creating something called the Fundrise Innovation Fund. And we've invested in just world-class private tech companies. I mean, so I actually- find that so interesting because like in a, in a situation, there are some people who would say, well, that's where all the crazy valuation is. And they're going to get smoked in the environment that we just, future earning companies have no chance in the environment that we just described. How, how are you thinking about that? Well, I mean, the, the, these are earlier stage companies. So you, there's actually a huge difference between the best and the worst. It's not like public companies that are, are you know, they are highly correlated and, and trade together. You know, the difference between like open AI and some, you know, normal AI company that's really just a wrapper of, uh, of chat GPT is, is um, huge. And so there are companies that are, have real tech that are foundational to what's happening in, in the AI revolution. And so if you can get into those companies, which we have, that is, it's a, it's a fundamental or investment rather than a cyclical investment. Cyclical investments are going to get destroyed in the in the in the coming downturn because of interest rates. But the fundamental investments, uh, and I can talk about some of the companies. Those companies, I mean, they're just they're they're making the future. So we we just wrapped up a um, a digital asset a festival of learning all about the next digital asset wave. Had a bunch of really smart people who are kind of pioneering in the space come on, and they were talking about a very sort of similar thing. It sounds like that you're looking for your AI focus, but they were talking across technology of really finding. It's gone from kind of building infrastructure to the now the companies that are going to kind of build the bridge to the next amazing application to reach mass, to reach critical mass, whether you're talking about um, individuals or corporations, and that there's an enormous amount of sort of energy in that space. And it sounds like you're saying something very similar with AI. Yeah, I don't mean digital assets. I mean, like real software companies. Right, right. That, that, um, you know, Fortune 500 companies like are using and have to use. And and, And I can name the companies. Most people never heard of them. But there's companies like DBT Labs and Databricks, and and those companies are the picks and shovels of the gold of the gold rush. I mean, they're they're the most 
important foundational technologies of what's happening in the world. And that's basically why we invested in them. And, and most people have never heard of them, right? They, you really have to be technically in the space. You have to be a data engineer or a data scientist to understand what these companies do. Uh, but that's fine with me because that's like, uh, that's how you know they're real. Yeah. How, how did you come to, ha- to come to, into the technology space, having a background more rooted in real estate? Well, Fundrise has 2 million users. We have 100 software engineers. We use all these technologies. And so if you are building uh, data pipelines, if you are doing data analytics, if you're you know, building with, uh, with a GPT, with the, you know, essentially the AI transformers that, that are you know, the, the guts of, of, of what driving all this change, then you know which technologies are, are, are fundamental, which ones are really important. Right. And then we we basically went to them. We hunted them down. So this company is so critical. We've got to we've got to invest in them. So do you feel like that progress will move along regardless of what happens on the macro environment because of the stage it's at? Well, I mean, prices came down a lot in tech over the last twenty four months, hmm. and so we I think we got like a, a good basis. But it's mostly in tech. Once you once you get rid of the craziness, like you know, not the you know what was happening a couple of years ago is 100, 200 times revenue. That's that's silly. But when you get down to more normalized pricing, the these companies, yeah, you know, if you just look at Fang last decade, right? Apple and Facebook and 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 Google, they I mean they went to a trillion, to Amazon two trillion dollar companies. I mean this this is going to happen again. I mean it's definitely AI is going to be bigger than cloud for sure. I mean, for sure, it, it's not going to happen tomorrow, right? It's not going to save us from the downturn, but it is, it is a revolution. And participating in that, I think it's like, it's a critical part of the investment strategy. Uh, Joe asking Ben Wood, when we're going to have to wrap it up in a minute, but this is so interesting. We always say, well, we'll have you back on Ben. Uh, would Fundrise consider lending to distressed startups again if we face another banking crisis like they did earlier this year? Yeah, that was, that was, um, so, when Silicon Valley Bank failed, people who aren't in the tech industry don't realize how much that just completely, it almost collapsed the whole tech industry. We weren't, we weren't, we didn't bank with Silicon Valley Bank, but we ha- have a fund. And so we stepped in and offered to bridge uh, a bunch of tech companies because uh, they couldn't make payroll. And we, we bridged a lot of well-known companies that everybody would have heard of, but it's, we need to keep it confidential. Mm-hmm. What, we, we didn't do that because we thought we were going to get rich we did, you know, that it was a good investment. It was a good loan. We did that because basically in the tech industry, if you're seen as a positive player in the ecosystem, we get deal flow. So we, to be a solution, to be a positive contributor to the community, is usually how you get great investments, great access. Because it's all about, in tech, it's all about access. That Everybody knows who the top 20, 30 companies are. It's literally listed. Like Bessemer has a list of the top 100 companies. We own three of the top five already. And that happened because our ability to have like relationships and reputation. And so reputation matters in tech much more than it does in most of finance. Most, most of finance is much more transactional. Yeah, that's so interesting. We, um, I think that speaks to our community because we talk about the importance of community and network and the values held by that community all the time. And we have an awesome community here, but it doesn't surprise me that extends through technology um, because we see, sort of see it in the background because a lot of our community is involved in that. So that's so interesting. I, I didn't realize that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to that fact, Ben. That's really fascinating. Um, ben, we're out of time and we know that you are so tired <laughs> coming off a crazy week. So I don't want to eat up any more of your time, but as always, really, really fascinating insight. Just so appreciate when you come on with us. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. That is, by the way, uh, Ben's like AI thoughts behind him. It's just not decoration, which I thought was <laughs> totally amazing. <laughs> um, ben, have a great weekend. And everybody, have a fantastic weekend. We'll be back next week. And take care and good luck out there. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Today's Real Vision Daily Briefing is sponsored by Crane Shares. Learn about their KCCA ETF at craneshares.com forward slash KCCA forward slash Real Vision.